Herbert Richard Bormeister was born on April the 7th, 1947. He was known to people as Herb in the Westfield, Indiana area. He was born to parents Herbert and Elizabeth, who had four children in total. Herb was the eldest, and not long after the last child was born, the family relocated to Indianapolis and lived in an upper-class town. When he was young and in school, Herb had a fascination with playing with dead animals. This was noticed and led to teachers deeming that he was a naughty child. After being confronted with this accusation, Herb retaliated and urinated on his teacher's desks. One time, he even brought in a dead bird and placed it on another teacher's desk. All of the other children at school found Herb quite weird and distanced themselves from him, making him quite a lonely child while at school. When he was a young teen, his antisocial behaviour did not improve so his parents pursued professional opinions and Herb was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Although he was given no further help for this because his parents did not accept the diagnosis. During his teens, he stayed at school and studied. While his grades and learning were said to be above average, his social life was well below and was considered a loner. He attempted to gain friends by joining the football team but he was not accepted and again went through his final year of school without one person that he could call a friend. In 1965, Herb was accepted into Indiana University, thinking that a new start would help him to make friends. But again, his strange behaviours were evident to people. And then, after a short while before his first ever year was completed, he left. His parents were not happy with his decision and pressurised him to go back and study anatomy. But Herb was so unhappy after his return to school, he left pretty quickly. But the time back had not totally been in vain, as he met and later married a lady called Juliana Sater, who studied journalism at the same university. It was found that the couple shared many interests and became very close. In 1971, the couple married and they started their life together, trying to start a business. But a short six months into their marriage, Herb's father intervened and had Herb committed to a mental institution. Luckily for Herb, this did not ruin his marriage and after only two months in the institute, the couple were back together. During their marriage, Herb fathered three children after his last child was born in 1984, he lost his steady job that his father secured for him at BMV and Juliana went back to work to support the family, while Herb was a stay-at-home dad. This was all going well until he started drinking a lot and hanging out in bars, most of which were part of the gay scene. In 1985, Herb was arrested for being in charge of a car that had hit a pedestrian while drunk. Surprisingly, he was only given a caution for the event. Then, after six months, another brush with the law, and this time, he stole a friend's car. But again, he was let off. Then Herb found a job at a thrift shop. He thought that the job there was not as good as a job he could get, but had a great work ethic, and realised there was a lot of money to be made with saving stores and finally opened the Save-A-Lot store in Indiana, which was incredibly successful and gave Herb and his family a more luxury lifestyle. A new home was purchased. It was a huge ranch in Indiana with stables and a pool. But the marriage was now not a happy one and the couple argued and separated after a couple of years. In 1990, while aged 42, Herb began his crime spree, which was set to rock Indiana and the US as a whole. There was a serial killer known as the I-70 Strangler. Bodies of young men who had been strangled kept appearing on the Interstate 70 in Indiana. The authorities had named the killer. The main suspect was a man named Brian Smart. It was said that Brian had tried to kill a man called Tony Harris, who went to the police 
as his friend was now missing. The police took the information down and proceeded to attempt to catch the killer of Tony's friend and the attempt on Tony's life. When Tony saw the man that attacked him again, he immediately reported the sighting to the police. They then named the suspect as Herb Bormeister. The authorities went to Herb's house to let him know of their findings and asked to search the house. But Herb denied them access as they did not produce a search warrant. They asked his wife, who also declined, as she later told the police that she was scared of her husband. And as they were in the process of trying to make a go of their marriage, she didn't want to anger him. After this revelation by police, Herb was increasingly volatile and aggressive at home. One day, when he had gone out for a business trip, Juliana called the police and they began the search of the expansive area on the ranch. Much to their horror was the discoveries they were about to make. Asked why she allowed the police into her home was another surprise to the police. She revealed that while her son was out playing in the ranch, he dug up part of a skeleton, which Herb explained away, saying he found it in the garage of the ranch when they moved in and he buried it. The search of the 18-acre land began at Fox Hollow Farm. The police discovered the remains of at least 11 young men, all buried at Herb's home. All remains were taken away and all were found to have been strangled, just like the I-70 victims. And so the two cases were joined and Herb was a wanted man for many murders. The warrant had now been executed for his arrest and upon hearing this, Herb fled to Ontario. The search continued until the 3rd of July, 1996, when Herb's body was found at Pinery Provincial Park on Lake Huron. He had shot himself in the head. He committed suicide before any of the victim's families could get any justice for their murdered loved ones. A note had been left behind this was a typical suicide note explaining the reason why Herb killed himself, such as his failed marriage and the fact that his business was in debt. He did not, however, make any reference to the many murders that he had committed. Only eight of the 11 men who were found in Herb's ranch were identified. Sadly, the other three still remain unknown, but are still counted on his victim count. The I-70 strangler victims were also added to Herb's count. The bodies of nine men, all found in laybys or wooded areas, just on the Interstate 70 in Indiana during the 1980s. The length of time that Herb was murdering people is still not fully known. Neither is his victim count. The reason he was also said to be the I-70 strangler was due to one witness statement identifying a person they believed was Herb with one of the I-70 victims. No further acts were committed after Herb died. Herb's wife Juliana was questioned by police to see if she had paid any part in the killings. She made a statement to say that she believed when Herb had said that the skull was uncovered by their son was found in the garage. She was seen to be telling the truth and let go with no charges brought to her. Would Herb have committed such gruesome acts if he was put in prison for his earlier car crimes or given help when he was diagnosed as a schizophrenic? All of these questions will sadly remain unanswered. Thank you for listening to Crime Busters. Please hit the like button if you have enjoyed this story. Please subscribe to us if you would like to listen to more crime stories from Crimebusters as we take you to the dark side.